This is an RNZ podcast. Namihi and welcome to Elemental, a podcast series from RNZ. I'm Alison Balance, and although I'm not a fan of heavy metal, at least when it comes to music, I have a growing appreciation of the finer points of heavy metals when it comes to chemistry. And I'm Alan Blackman from Auckland University of Technology Chemistry Department. It's episode 11, which means we are up to bismuth. Now, what can I tell you about bismuth? Well, nothing actually, which is why it's a very good thing that Alan's here. Well, indeed, bismuth is a little surprising. As you've sort of correctly alluded to, it is indeed a heavy metal. And when we sort of think of heavy metals, we think of them being a bit nasty. But this one you can actually get at your local pharmacy. The name may give it away, but we will come to that. Before we begin, obviously, we give all the vital statistics. So we're talking about bismuth today. Bismuth, uh, the chemical symbol BI, atomic number 83. And that puts it down the bottom of the periodic table towards the right-hand side. And it is in group 15, the same group as arsenic and antimony, two elements that we've already met. Real gory details, if you want to get in the real chemistry of it, it is both pentavalent and trivalent. Oh, I love it when you talk heavy like that, even if I don't understand what you mean. Pentavalent. Tri is obviously three. Pentavalent. Pent is five. Indeed it is, and that's to do with the number of electrons that it desperately wants to lose. So it can lose three or it can uh, lose five in a lot of its compounds. It has an interesting history. It was often confused with other elements uh, back in the early days, particularly tin and lead, uh, because it was often found with those in natural deposits. So in the year 1753, a French guy by the name of Claude François Geoffroy He showed that it was actually a distinct element and it wasn't tin and it wasn't lead. Bismuth commonly occurs as the mineral bismuthinite. Oh, try try saying that when you're drunk. (laughs) Bismuthinite. Bismuthinite. Bismuthinite, yes. And what we find is because bismuth occurs with sort of relatively cheap metals such as tin and lead, then uh, it's a relatively cheap metal to get at because you can get it as a byproduct of the extraction of these other uh, metals, particularly lead. So bismuth occurs uh, in combination with lead ores, also tungsten, zinc as well. And uh, so that makes it quite a cheap, heavy metal, particularly when you consider that around about uh, 10% of lead deposits actually are bismuth. Well, apart from having spent a lot of time being mistakenly identified for something else. It's an unusual heavy metal, you say. What are some of the features that make it unusual? Well, the fact that the solid form of bismuth is less dense than the liquid form. How does that happen then? Well, that means that when you freeze it, it expands. So just like something else that we're all familiar with, water, which expands as it freezes, and so therefore the solid form is therefore less dense than the liquid form. Very, very unusual. doesn't happen uh, in too many compounds. And certainly not in metals. No, indeed indeed not. So this is, this is quite an unusual characteristic of bismuth. Another unusual characteristic of bismuth, it's got the atomic number 83. We talked about that before. It's putting it down the very bottom of the periodic table, or certainly towards the bottom, which means that you're getting into those radioactive elements, some of which we've already met. And for many, many years, it was thought that bismuth was the heaviest non-radioactive element. But in 2003, that was disproven. And in fact, they found that bismuth was radioactive. The reason that they hadn't found that at that time was that it had a half-life of around about 10 to the power of 19 years. 10 to the power of 19 So that's 10 million, million, million years. That's a lot of zeros. That is a lot of zeros. And in fact, uh, in terms of uh, our understanding, the universe is around about 14 billion years old. So really, we're talking the uh, the half-life of bismuth being a billion times longer than the actual universe itself. Does that mean none of it's actually ever decayed? No, no, it doesn't. It just means that very, very little of it has actually decayed. So let's say we had a gram of bismuth uh, at the start of the universe and we let it do its thing up until the present day and we would still then have 0.9999999999 grams of it. 
<laughs> right. So it is radioactive, but we can, for all intents and purposes, treat it as a stable isotope. Absolutely, yes. Yep. What does it decay to, by the way, when it eventually gets there? So it, it decays to thallium, and again, that's a metal that we're going to meet in a while, probably August, September or whenever, uh, and that's a deadly poison, but that's another story. Another feature of bismuth is that it is diamagnetic, which is possibly a new word to many. Yes, which is um, what? Which, <laughs> which simply means that it gets repelled by a magnetic field. Instead of attracted? Instead of attracted, and you might think, well, that's a bit weird because it's a, it's a metal, so you would think that metals get attracted to magnetic fields. Common experience would show us that that's not necessarily the case. Something like aluminium, for example, is non-magnetic. Bismuth actively repels a magnetic field, and so therefore what you can do is if you've got a magnet, you can physically levitate it between two bits of bismuth. If you get those bits of bismuth exactly right, or their positioning's exactly right, then you can levitate a magnet between it because the bottom piece of bismuth is busy uh, pushing it up and the top piece of bismuth is busy pushing it down. Can so you use get that? that? Right. You can potentially, so you may have heard of maglev trains, for example. Oh, the um, super magnetic, fast ones. It's the same principle, except in maglev trains they use uh, different materials, but entirely the same principle of uh, levitation. It really is an unusual heavy metal, isn't it? And I'm thinking, desperately seeking non-chemical analogies here. It's a bit like the spelling of English words. There's all these rules like I before E, but then you get all the exceptions like weird <laughs> uh, that are just, well, weird. And so in that sense, bismuth is weird. It's a heavy metal that doesn't follow the heavy metal rules, really. Chemistry's full of that. We try and make rules, we try and make generalisations all across the periodic table, and then, of course, we find, no, nah, there's always exceptions. Now, I have to confess, I haven't worked out the pharmacy clue yet. What's that about? OK, as I said, there's a hint in the name, so you may have heard of something called Pepto-Bismol. Something to do with heartburn. Yeah, indeed. That's that sort of thing. So gastrointestinal uses, so heartburn, diarrhoea, sort of, you know, down your tummy, that sort of thing. And again, very, very, very unusual because we think of bismuth as being a heavy metal like things like lead, for example, which is a heavy metal, which is, you know, nasty for you. But compounds of bismuth are actually good for you. This Pepto-Bismol contains a compound called bismuth subsalicylate. And this has been known since the early 1900s, and it was originally prescribed for uh, infant diarrhoea under the name Bismozel Mixture Cholera Infantum. Well, that'll be and a big seller. <laughs> it would. So therefore, let's, let's get the name cholera out of that, and uh, it's been selling well ever since. It's a nice pink colour, and it also gives rise to those sort of the pearly sheen in cosmetics, sort of nail polish, stuff like that. Those are bismuth compounds in there. Ha, huh, didn't know that. Any other uses? It's proving to be quite versatile so far. Well, indeed, and we've talked about a connection with lead all the way through this. We know that lead is not very good for you. Uh, bismuth shares a lot of the properties of lead. It's nice and dense, for example, but it's non-toxic, and so therefore that leads to it being used increasingly in situations where lead was used. Things like ceramic glazes, for example, where you go fishing, you uh, used to use lead weights. Now bismuth is sort of taking over that. And if you're into such things, with, which I'm desperately not, shooting, waterfowl hunting, lead shot is now becoming sort of bismuth shot. Hmm. Also, sprinklers on the roof in your office or wherever you are, uh, how do they work? They work thanks to bismuth being alloyed with another element, cadmium, and that gives you a melting point of 70 degrees. So you put a bunch of this in your valve. Uh, if you have a fire and it gets above 70 degrees, then it melts, all the water comes out, hey-ho, you've got sprinklers. So I'm just gazing at the ceiling of this recording studio and giving a <laughs> hello up there, Bismuth, a wave at the fire sprinklers. That's great to know. This reminds me a little bit of what was that other element we did? Oh, I know, americium. That Indeed. was in um, smoke detectors. Yes, the, yes, yeah, keeping the, us all safe. Yeah, excellent line in fire prevention. <laughs> What's an interesting random fact about Bismuth? Okay, very random fact. If you are a fireworks aficionado, you'd know about dragon's eggs and they finish off their display with a sharp crack and that is bismuth compounds doing that. Well, I think we'll just finish off our chemical display by signing off. Bang! I'm Alison Balance. <laughs> this is the RNZ podcast Elemental. You can find us online at rnz.co.nz slash chemistry. And you can also subscribe and catch up with all of our episodes wherever you found this podcast. We're back next time with Boron, but for now, from me, 
Alan Blackman from Auckland University of Technology. And me, Alison Balance. Bye for now. 